So we try to look at basically model-based planning, uh, but with a so the uh, past the official start time. All okay. of the people who were there in the previous session haven't come back, but usually have some attrition after the lunch break. That's common. Uh, so I think we can just start. Okay, so uh, we left off with this notation for the two-stage case. Uh, and so I'm just going to go over this again, and then I'll make a couple comments about this versus uh, maybe an MDP setting. Uh, so uh, we have N uh, trajectories. You know, if you're in the clinical trials world or the precision medicine world, you can think about this as being N patients. And for each one, you have X1, A1, X2, A2, Y. So X1 is baseline information. It's a vector of baseline features. Uh, and in fact, you know, this doesn't, I, I wrote here as being in Euclidean space. There's some instances where there might also be functional data or imaging data and so on. But uh, for simplicity, I'll just assume it's Euclidean. You have a first stage treatment, which is coded in 0, 1, A1. Uh, X2 is information you collect during the course of the first treatment. Uh, and we'll assume that's in, in P2, RP2. And then we have a second treatment, again, binary. And Y is the outcome or the utility coded so that higher values are better. Uh, we define the history at stage one to be H1 is just X1 and H2 is X1, A1, X2. And so we are not assuming, uh, for example, that Y only depends on, let's say, X2 and A2, uh, but it can in fact depend on the whole history. Uh, it, in the extension of what I'm going to show you to multiple stages, you still don't need to assume that it's Markov, meaning that like stage three does not have to be independent of stage one given the information at stage two. Uh, and the way that we're going to be able to get past that. Uh, is by having a finite horizon. Uh, obviously, with an infinite horizon case, if you don't assume any kind of additional structure, it's kind of hopeless because you can never extrapolate beyond the observed period. Uh, so uh, that's uh, the setup here. Um, and uh, here we look at policies or, or treatment regimes, DTRs, dynamic treatment regimes, pi, which are a pair of functions, pi one and pi two, one for each stage. For pi t maps the history at stage t to an action or a, or a decision or a treatment. So, you know, if you're following pi and a patient presented at time t with history capital HT equals little ht, they would be assigned treatment to pi t of ht. Okay. And we're going to focus on uh, Q learning. So, the optimal treatment regime maximizes the expected outcome if treatments are made according to pi. So, I'll write E sub superscript pi here. I'm going to suppress some of the oops, I'm going to suppress some of the causal inference stuff here. Uh, we will talk a little bit about potential outcomes, you know, if we get to it later. Uh, but but here I'm just going to um, kind of uh, just use this notation to indicate that this expectation is with respect to the distribution of y that's induced by assigning treatment according to pi. And to characterize the regime that maximizes this, we're going to use the q functions. So here, q2, h2, a2 is the expected outcome given second stage history H2 and second stage treatment A2. And Q1 is the expected maximized second stage Q function given H1 equals little h1 and A1 equals little a1. So this is the expected outcome for a patient who is presenting at time two with history H2 and is treated according to A2. Whereas this is Q1 is the expected outcome for a patient presenting at time one with history H1 treated with A1 and then treated optimally in future. And we know from dynamic programming uh, that the optimal strategy, the optimal regime, pi t opt uh, of ht is the argmax over all treatments, uh, at, qt, ht, at. So uh, seeing this representation uh, immediately suggests a strategy for estimation. So q2 here, uh, it's just the regression of y on h2 and a2. So we can estimate that using uh, some kind of regression method. And then while we don't observe Q2, we can plug in an estimator, say Q hat two here, and regress that in H1, A1, uh, or the maximization of or the maxim, maximized Q hat two. Uh, and so that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to look at Q learning. Uh, and here, you know, the distinction should be made that, that when I say Q learning, I'm talking about this sort of regression based dynamic programming thing, uh, which I'm going to present, which is, you know, what is typically used in statistics and, and, and biostatistics. Uh, which in contrast to, you know, uh, Watkins and Diane, you know, kind of usual Q learning. Um, so it's similar in spirit, uh, but it's, uh, this is obviously finite horizon. So uh, just to make that distinction. Uh, and also, you know, we have continuous states and so on, but uh, the idea is the same. So here there is some, some Q and A going on about sort of treatment regimes versus policies. Uh, 
Is it just a terminological mm -hmm. distinction? And also, like, does regime come from? Why? Why are these called regimes? It, does it just come from regimen, like for treatment, something like that? Oh, you guys are testing testing my my history here. So the the the, well, the term the terms mean the same thing. That's the that's the easy answer. So uh, uh, policy or treatment strategy or adaptive treatment strategy, a treatment regime or dynamic treatment regime, uh, all mean the same thing. Uh, the term treatment regime, I think, goes back to Jamie Robbins, uh, and uh, I don't know what the what this. I, I think. I mean, uh, both Robbins and, and and Murphy used it early. Uh, I don't know why they chose regime. There's others who then pushed for regimen because they thought you know regime sounded like some kind of oppressive government or something. So they tried to go to regimen, but I think regime stuck. The term dynamic is sometimes, it, it actually refers to the personalization. So the one stage stuff would still be a dynamic treatment regime because it's personalizing, whereas a static regime is one that's not tailored to individual characteristics. So unlike every other setting on earth, dynamic does not refer to changing in time. It refers to changing the treatment recommendation. Uh, so it's dynamic in that sense. So that's a little, I think that's a confusing point uh, in terms of the, the terminology that's used. Uh, but yeah, I don't know where the, well, I think when it was first used, there wasn't much cross-pollination between CS and the stats world. It was mostly causal inference people looking at longitudinal observational studies. And so they came up with their own terminology. So I don't think that was really bridged until later. So, I mean, the connection between RL and, uh, dynamic treatment regimes so thanks uh, yeah thanks uh so okay uh the regression based dynamic programming so what do we do we po posit some kind of working models for the q function say q t h t a t of beta t so the q function is stage t indexed by some parameters beta t h t zero transpose beta t zero plus a t h t one transpose beta t one so here h t zero and h t one are just fixed feature vectors constructed from HT. So they could include polynomial terms or they could include other basis functions. Uh, and uh, AT is just this interaction term. So if you look at this, you can see that the first term doesn't have a treatment in it. And the optimal treatment according to QT is going to be the, uh, it's going to be one if HT1 transpose beta T1 is positive and uh, zero if it's negative. Uh, okay, so in order to estimate the Q functions, we use least squares. Uh, so yeah, you get beta hat two to be the least squares estimator. So PN Y minus Q2, H2, A2, beta two squared. So just do these squares, it gives you beta hat two. And then for the first stage, you're gonna plug in the maximized estimated second stage Q function here. So you see this is the max over A2. This should be little A2, that's a typo. Uh, Q2, H2, little A2, beta hat two. Uh, that now becomes the response. And then you're regressing it on this linear model here for the first stage. So this is just, if you look back here, we're just plugging in uh, the estimated Q function here, uh, and then regressing it on H1 and A1. So I guess it's beta hat one. And then pi hat T of HT is the argmax of QT, HT, AT, beta hat T. Okay, so it's really just, you know, two regressions and a maximization. So very uh, easy to implement. Uh, and to define the sort of targets for inference, the population parameters beta star T. Well, to find those is what you get if you just replace these empirical expectations with the true uh, expectations, the true population expectations. So replace this with a P. So this would just be the projection of the outcome on Q2. And then you would plug that Q2 in here and look at this projection on Q1. And that's how we're gonna define these population parameters. So again, we're not assuming the linear models are correct. We're just going to assume that, that we are, are going to try to conduct inference for those projections. And we're gonna focus on confidence intervals for some linear combination of beta one star the reason is that beta two star, this is just least squares here, right? This is just least squares. So inference for beta two star is straightforward. You can construct a wall type confidence interval, do the bootstrap or any of those things would be fine. Normal approximation. So we're gonna focus on beta, uh, sorry, beta one star, which is where uh, the non-regularity plays a role. And why is there gonna be non-regularity? Well, we've seen this now a number of times, it's this max operator. This is where things are going to, to be problematic. So this max is non-differentiable and that's where we're gonna get that instability just like we had with the max of means and just like we had with uh, the indicator in um, the value function. 
Okay, so the non-smooth max operator makes beta hat one non-regular. Uh, the distribution. I have a question on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. So, why uh, why may not be the conditional mean of y might not be linear in H two? Uh, that's right. Right, and so that's why you say we, we projection. But that's now, right. whatever it is, once I estimate beta two, then my u two is linear, right? So in the next equation. Um, the nonlinearity just comes from the max value. That that's the only reason it's a project. Like you're projecting to linear functions, because because q two is already a linear function, right? Oh, this is this this thing. Well, okay, two things. One, th this would be this term here would be a linear function of h two and a two. Yep. Then you take the max, and now it's no longer a linear function because of the max, right? So if it was like uh, it would be the positive part, so. The max of Q2 will be the positive part of HT1 transpose beta T1. So that won't be linear anymore, right? Okay, and that's then pulled back into the linear space by this second least space. By this term, yeah. And then also, uh, even if even if we, we put some kind of, um, I don't know, even if it was somehow linear in some basis functions, uh, it may not be linear in H1 and A1. It may only be linear in H2 and A2, but not linear in H1 and A1. Ah, uh, I see, because I'm now regressing on H1. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. Uh, okay. Let's see. I'm losing my mouse here. Okay, so uh, the consequence of, of beta hat 1 being non regular is that the distribution of C transpose root n beta hat 1 minus beta 1 star is sensitive to small perturbations of the, generative, of the underlying generative model P. And also the limiting distribution does not have mean zero. So often we think about, you know, these kind of things having mean zero. That's what we call asymptotic bias. So uh, of course there's always, not always, but there's often finite sample bias, but uh, asymptotically the mean of this is not zero. Uh, and this typically occurs when we have small second stage effects, meaning that H21 transpose beta 21 star can be small or more accurately, I, I should say that eight, there's variability of H21 transpose beta hat 21 when H21 transpose beta star 21 is close to zero. And we'll, we'll see that in a theorem in a second. Uh, and why is that? Well, because that's what this max operator here is only affects the second term. And the max of this thing is going to only be non-smooth where this is zero. That's where the point of non-differentiability is going to occur. Uh, and we'll see, we'll formalize that in a second. So. Uh, as we hopefully have now been convinced, confidence intervals based on series approximations of bootstrap can perform poorly. Uh, and so one of the things that was sort of put forward uh, early was to apply shrinkage methods. And I wanna talk about whether or not those uh, have the intended effect. Oh, sorry, uh, question was what's TXT? Uh, oh, treatment, sorry. Yeah, I will sometimes write TXT for treatment. I tried to fit this all in one line. So uh, yeah, treatment. Second stage treatment effects. Uh, okay, so try to reduce the asymptotic bias through shrinkage uh, or to form conservative estimates of the tail probabilities of this quantity, which is what we'll uh, also talk about. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about asymptotic bias reduction. So we've been talking about kind of distributional approximations. Let's talk just about the mean for a minute. So given some constant vector C that is the same dimension as beta one star and some root n consistent estimator say beta tilde one of beta star one. So it could be least squares, it could be something else. Uh, Cause we're gonna talk about some alternative estimators in a second such that root n uh, beta one tilde minus beta one star converges to some distribution M. Uh, and then we'll define the C directional asymptotic bias say bias of beta tilde one C to be the expectation of C transpose M. So it's just the, this is the expectation of, of M transpose C or C transpose M. And in a, in a standard problem, this would be zero, uh, but here it, it is non-zero. And in fact, you can actually work out what it is uh, for Q learning. Assuming all the right moments exist for any C, the bias of the least squares estimator, the one we just talked about, the direction of C has this form uh, okay, so there's a lot to unpack here, but let's just see what's going on. So there's uh, C transpose times some kind of covariance term. Uh, so here I've just combined the first stage regressors into a single vector B, B1. And so this is the outer product, expectation of the outer product B1, B1 transpose. Uh, and what you see here is that 
the bias is driven by this term here. So I mentioned this idea of these effects being small. So first, let's, let's work backwards. The indicator H21 transpose beta 21 star is zero. So we see that it's those patients that have zero treatment effect at the second stage that are driving this bias. And it's weighted by this term here, which is actually the variance of, uh, there we go. It's actually the variance of H21 transpose beta hat 21, right? So that you get this quadratic form. So what's happening here is that we're gonna get very large bias if we have a lot of variability in H21 transpose beta hat 21 among those patients that have no effect. So uh, now that we've managed, so okay, the reason that's important is that a lot of the bias shrinkage methods try to reduce the variability of H21 transpose beta hat 21 around those patients for which H21 transpose beta star 21 equals zero. That's their strategy. Because the idea is if you can drive this variance down, and then we see that this bias is actually an average of C transpose sigma one infinity B1 taken with respect with it's the weighted average with these weights. If they can drive these weights down, then the bias will go down. That's the idea. Uh, and so they're in particular going to try to shrink H21 transpose beta hat 21 when they think H21 transpose beta star 21 is zero. So that's the idea, try to reduce this bias. Okay. So maybe I'll just pause here because there's a lot of symbols on the, on the side uh, and, and, and take any questions. Okay, so you have this bias, which means that if, if you take the limiting distribution, it doesn't have mean zero. And so one of the ideas to reduce bias is by some kind of shrinkage. And the idea is that if you can reduce the bias, then you, you look at a confidence interval it might have better coverage because it's centered at a better place. So Chakraborty et al. looked at soft thresholding, uh, Moody et al. looked at hard thresholding, Goldberg and Song looked at some kind of lasso penalization, and there's been some other more recent methods, but the idea is, the, is more or less the same. Uh, the idea is that if we write max Q2 uh, with our model, with beta hat plugged in, we get H20 beta hat 20, there's no A here, so it doesn't affect this term, plus the max over A2 and 0, 1 of A2 transpose H21 beta hat 21, and that becomes the positive part of H21 transpose beta hat 21. And so this is what max Q2 looks like. And this thing, of course, looks like a, you know, a hockey stick or something. So it's, it's uh, got a kink in it. And so that's where the non-smoothness comes in. And so what they're going to try to do is shrink this thing towards zero when they think it's close to zero. So it's a little bit like an adaptive lasso or something similar. So in particular, uh, the soft threshold method replaces this positive part with the positive part times this term in the braces. So it's times one minus sigma H21, capital sigma hat 21, H21. So this is the, the estimated variance divided by N times H21 beta hat 21 squared. Okay, and sigma is a tuning parameter, one minus this. So what's gonna happen here? Well, if uh, H21 transpose beta hat 21 is big, right? If it gets really large, then uh, this term here is going to, to um, go to zero, and we just end up with what we had before, right? And in particular, you know, if you let n get large and this term is not zero, then this term is going to dominate because this is going to go to a constant, right? On the other hand, uh, if this term, if H21 transpose beta star 21 is zero, then this thing is going to converge to a normal distribution squared, or I guess some kind of chi squared distribution. Uh, and so this, will, this ratio will not be zero. <clears throat> And we're multiplying this term here by something less than one. So that's the idea. And the amount of shrinkage is governed by sigma, which is some tuning parameter greater than or equal to zero. Set it to zero, you just get back the original estimator. Uh, and the penalization schemes I mentioned, they're this, they reduce this estimator under certain designs. And there's no theoretical justification in chakraborty at all, but they do show improved coverage in bootstrap intervals in some settings, and same goes for these other uh, references. And there's been some recent work on, on smoothing uh, in a similar vein. Okay, so what can we say about, about this approach? So it turns out that uh, you can actually work out exactly what this bias will be for the soft threshold estimator. Uh, so if you let... Um, C again be a fixed vector and beta hat one sigma denote the soft thresholding estimator. That means you do Q learning, but you plug in that soft thresholding estimator in place of the second stage Q function when you do your first stage regression. Then assuming all the right moments exist, 
you can show the bias of the soft thresholding is always less asymptotic bias and soft thresholding is always less than the asymptotic bias of Q learning, less than or equal to for any sigma greater than zero. And if the bias is non-zero, so if you're in a setting where you do have asymptotic bias, then you can actually work out what the ratio of the, of the asymptotic bias is. So the bias of soft thresholding relative to uh, just a standard estimator has this form. So e to the minus sigma over two minus sigma times the integral from root sigma to infinity one over x e to the minus x squared. So if there are any students taking you know an intro stats class or recognize this as like some kind of normal integral, that's, all, that, that's where this comes from. Uh, and what you see is that if you let sigma go to infinity, this thing goes to zero. Uh, so importantly, you know, you have this lower bound here. Uh, so more shrinkage is better under a fixed parameter asymptotic framework, right? So everything here has been fixed. So, uh, so the question is, is it really useful? So it seems that, that this, this seems to suggest that it would be, right? Um, <clears throat> Uh, not only is it better, but also more is better. Chakraborty at all suggests sigma equals three. Uh, so if you plug that in, you find out that that, that ratio ends up being a, a 13 fold decrease in the asymptotic uh, bias. So it's a huge reduction in bias, 13 times. Uh, uh, however- so, yeah. so bias is not a number, right? You define, it's a number if I fix a direction. 13 fold oh. Interesting fact that this does not depend on C over here. Oh, yeah, the C cancels, which is kind of neat, I guess. The definition involves a direction, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah, that's right. The definition involves the direction, but once you take the ratio, the C cancels, uh, which is maybe surprising. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, so that's a good point. I should have said that. That's a good point. Yeah. So, uh, so the ratio will be a, will be thirteen, basically, to plug in sigma. Are approximately 13. Uh, however, this is based on these point-wise asymptotics, and so it may not actually reflect finite sample performance. So let's see what happens if we look at this through a local asymptotic framework. So now we've seen all this, and so hopefully this is not so so horrible. Uh, we use local asymptotic approximation as before. So for any local parameter s of the same dimension as beta two one star, we're going to assume there exists a sequence of distributions p n. So that PN is converging to P in this sense. Uh, and that the important piece is that beta two one star N, meaning the least squares, the, the, the part of the second stage Q function interacting with treatment, that, that coefficient uh, under PN is equal to the one under P plus some local perturbation uh, where beta two N star is the argument, uh, it's just the least squares estimated under PN. So again, we're gonna look at things under this local perturbation and we're gonna try to study the asymptotic bias where we look at these local perturbations as a generative model. And if we do that. Just Eric, just related to this 13 fold, I mean 13 fold, but like what, what is the what is the magnitude of these quantities? I mean, how how maybe, maybe you show us an example later, but but I will show you a plot here uh, in like three slides. Oh, okay, good. I'll get uh, okay, so if we look into this local generative model and we take the soup over local perturbations of the asymptotic bias of the original estimator, it's bounded above by some constant K. Okay? So uh, no matter what perturbation sequence I take, the asymptotic bias is always bounded. But if I take the soft thresholding estimator and I take the soup over local perturbations, it diverges to infinity as the amount of shrinkage increases. So what this is showing is that if you, if you try to do this shrinkage, it can be infinitely worse than doing nothing uh, in small samples. And what this is sort of suggesting, I guess I should say, is local asymptotic approximation. And this is not super surprising uh, in the sense that we know with super efficient estimators, you, you, you have results like this, uh, where you know it appears to be doing much better, but then if you look at sort of uh, local alternatives, the, the risk goes to infinity or, or you have other kind of problematic behavior. But uh, so, so here, uh, there is no free lunch. We can't just we can't just shrink aggressively. Of course, that makes sense because if we over penalize, we're shrinking that term to zero for everyone, um, or let sigma go to infinity, we, we would be shrinking that second term in our second stage Q function to zero. Uh, so then there's this issue of well, okay, fine. So too much is bad, 
but zero doesn't seem great either. So maybe there's some way to construct a data-driven choice of sigma that somehow leads to good performance no matter what the data are. And I'm going to try to convince you that that may be true, but it, it's very difficult and probably not worth it. So uh, to do that, consider data from a two-arm trial. So you have treatment uh, AI and outcome YI, no covariates, treatment zero, one. Uh, sorry, if you can hear my kids screaming, I apologize. They are uh, killing each other, I think. But I, they're both screaming, so they're both still alive. Uh, OK, so. Uh, why is, is CODIS and root values better? Higher, the higher values are better. Define mu star A to be the expectation of Y given treatment A, mu hat to be just the sample mean under that treatment. Uh, and the mean outcome of the optimal treatment assignment then, as we've seen, I'll call it theta star here, is the max of mu zero mu one. So we're back to our max of means problem. And the corresponding estimator theta hat, which is the max of those two, uh, I guess I should have put it, uh, zero here instead of a star, but it's the same estimator. Uh, it's just the max of the two means, which I could write as mu hat zero plus the positive part of mu hat one minus mu hat zero. So if mu hat one is greater than mu hat zero, this term is just mu hat one minus mu hat zero, which can't, so the mu hat zero cancels. On the other hand, if mu hat zero is greater than mu hat one, the term inside here is negative, so the positive part zero, we get back mu hat zero. And the soft, so the reason I wrote it this way is because you have a term that doesn't depend on treatment and a positive part, so it mimics what we had before. Right, this looks just like our Q function. So the soft thresholding estimator in this case would be mu hat zero plus the positive part of mu hat one minus mu hat zero, one minus four sigma over N mu hat one minus mu hat zero squared. So this is the equivalent estimator in the simple problem. Okay, so now uh, here's what the bias looks like. Uh, I'm looking at showing you the bias uh, here uh, and it's color coded, so green is good, red is bad, and bias goes from zero to two. Uh, here, the, the y-axis is mu one minus mu zero, so the true difference. And I, the amount of uh, variability here is chosen so that uh, you know, minus one to one covers, uh, I think, you have very little ability to tell where you are in here based on the estimator. So that is to say, the, the a confidence interval, I think, would have a range of about three or four in the setting, based on how I chose the residual variance. And so you really don't know where you are in this band. So if you, if you get a mu hat one minus mu hat zero, you don't really know where you are on this band. You might be at zero. Like if your point estimate was zero, you wouldn't know if you're really at one or minus one. And on the uh, x-axis here is sigma. So this is the true difference in means. This is the, uh, this is the, the amount of soft thresholding. Zero is no threshold, no, no, uh, shrinkage, five is a lot of shrinkage, and three is what was recommended by Chalk or Bordy et al. And so what you see here is that if the true difference was zero, then it gets slightly darker green as we move across. And so you should you should pick sigma as big as you possibly can, which makes sense because the difference is zero. Uh, but if the difference were say minus 0.5, then, then the amount of shrinkage should be quite small, say somewhere in here, 0.2 maybe. Uh, and if you were to pick three, then now you have kind of a lot of bias. You have a bias of about uh, one. So uh, that, that would mean that the bias is twice as big as the difference in magnitude uh, between mu one and mu zero. And similarly, you know, if, if the truth were one, and then, then you should have basically no bias. But if you chose a value of three as recommended, you'd be uh, pretty severe bias, 1.5 uh, and, and so on. So. Uh, so then, okay, fine. So n equals 10 is the sample size I'm showing you here. That's uh, pretty extreme. So what happens if n equals 100? So and if, you, if n equals 100, then of course, uh, we have a much better sense of where we are in the scale. So we have a mu hat minus mu one will give us much more information about mu one minus mu zero. So we'll probably likely be in here somewhere. But if you zoom in, this is the picture you get and it's exactly the same, right? Once you zoom in and you, and you, and you classify the uncertainty here, uh, in terms of like, uh, this is about the same amount of confidence you would have for n equals 100, you, you could basically say if it was really zero, then you would really have information that was between whatever, minus three and three. Uh, that's a confidence interval would, would easily would cover that. Uh, now you're in the same situation again. So in terms of, of what you should choose, it's not clear. So if I just tell you you're somewhere on this line between minus three and three, what sigma should you choose? Uh, 
you'll probably come up with something pretty small if you want to be safe, right? Obviously, you can do better if you had more a more accurate estimator of that difference, but you don't. Um, and so it's really a game you can't win, essentially. Or, or if you're going to win, the amount of bias reduction you're going to get is going to be quite small. You know, so uh, the, the point here is that the variability of mu hat minus mu one prevents identification of the optimal value of sigma because you don't know where you are in this line because of the variability. And using a plug-in estimator could lead to large bias. So you could, you know, the truth could be zero. Your estimator could be one. Say so you're here, your estimator could be or minus one. And uh, so you you um, you plug in a small value and sort of miss out here. But if your if your true difference was minus one and you were at zero, right? So your point estimator was zero, but the truth was minus one. So you say, oh, let's have a ton of shrinkage. You could really pay a huge price down here, right? So data-driven uh, choice of sigma that in significantly improves asymptotic bias over no shrinkage is, is difficult. So I, I don't have an impossibility result, but um, I think it's a very hard game to win uh, and it may not be worth it. And we know it can be infinitely worse if you do it wrong. So does that answer your question, Ambush, did you ask before? Yes, uh, but I still want to make sure I understand. So this bias that you talked about is not that is it at the scale of one over square root n. So, the, so it's, we still have consistency. But the issue yes. is that yeah. once we take one over square root n times the difference of the estimator minus the true, that limit has some non-zero mean. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, scale the bias is of order one over root n. Yeah. Okay, and that's a problem when you're constructing confidence intervals. That's right. Which is why we are worrying about this. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, because they're shrinking at rate one over root n. So, yeah, so that's a significant bias. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, Thanks. And these shrinkage methods, I mean, I have seen them, and you mentioned last, so like in the high dimensional setting, but here it's not high dimensional. Right. And this is extremely low dimensional. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, but the. And so, and so there, there's there and the, in the other case, I mean, you're incurring so much estimation error too, that you, that the shrinkage buys you a lot in terms of MSC here. The purpose is different. It's supposed to be to reduce asymptotic bias. Uh, yeah. Got it. So the reason why you do shrinkage is actually very different. Yes. Even, even though the method might look very similar. Oh, I do soft, stretch, soft thresholding we do in high dimensional models also. We're doing it here, but the reasons are, so yeah, I just wanted to make sure that's like separate. And that's right, yeah. Um, okay, so asymptotic bias is, exists in Q-learning. Again, it's because it's non-regularity. Local asymptotics show that if we shrink too much, uh, it can be infinitely worse than doing nothing, which is not that surprising. Uh, Data-driven tuning seems to require choosing sigma to be very small or risking a very large bias. Um, okay, so now I wanna talk about, about confidence intervals. So you know, even though we have this asymptotic bias, we can still construct uh, consistent confidence intervals and we can do this by bounding. So the, so the bounding will cover those local perturbations, which will also cover that bias. And so we can still get um, regular uh, asymptotically correct confidence intervals. And so we're going to construct our bounds now in C transpose written beta hat one minus beta star. We'll bootstrap those bounds to get a confidence interval. Uh, it will, because we're taking those soup for local perturbations, it'll be the tightest among all regular bounds, uh, which gives us that automatic adaptivity that we mentioned before. Uh, this is also known as lo local uniform convergence. And you can also get conditional properties. So Robbins and Ronitsky uh, showed that. Um, and you can also get global uniform convergence, which I'll say something about at the end. Okay, so how do we get a bound? Well, first what we do is we take- uh, What is the C in, in like application C would be like, it would be an indicator, like you're only doing inference on a coordinate or- oh, C, C, C could be could be uh, just a unit vector, uh, standard, uh, like a canonical uh, unit vector, you know, like one in one component, zeros everywhere else. It can also be a, a H1 if you wanted to look at the Q function for the for the first H Q function for an individual. It could be just a, a contrast, for example, to look at um, a difference in, in say two components. Like what would happen if you change something? Yeah, yeah. It's usually one of the coefficients, so so one of the components of beta one star, or the predicted value for an individual given the first H history. Okay, so to, to, to 
get these bounds uh, on C transpose. So we're going to derive an upper bound on C transpose written beta hat minus beta, beta one hat minus beta one star. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to write VNC gamma to be the sum of two terms, and uh, which is going to be this decomposition here, essentially. Uh, C transpose SN, so this is some smooth term, and I've given it here. So this just comes from literally writing out the definitions of these. You end up with a term here that's PN minus P of a bunch of fixed random variables. So the central limit theorem is going to apply. These are going to be asymptotically normal. So S for smooth plus C transpose sigma one inverse PN U of gamma. So now U is for non-smooth, on smooth. Uh, so UN here is B1 times the positive part of H21 times ZN plus gamma minus H21 transpose gamma. So here Zn is going to converge to a normal distribution, but this gamma is now kind of playing the role of a local parameter, or an additional parameter. And it turns out that if you plug in uh, beta star here, beta 21 star for gamma, you reduced exactly down to this quantity. So the way in which we're going to get a smooth upper bound is going to be by souping over these terms here. These are going to be the local perturbation terms. So I think, Eric, you already explained this to us. I mean, you started the talk by saying that there is non-regular non situations, you have problems, and uh, but now we here we are back to talking about regular bounds. So I think there are some questions on Zoom about just maybe reminding people, like, why are we worrying about regularity and what is a regular bound? Just because oh. this material is a little bit unfamiliar. To yeah, that's right. Okay, so what what are we, what's our goal? Yeah, let me go back and say this. So, th so the idea is, is similar to, to what we did in the first two sections in that we can't bootstrap this thing. We can't use a normal approximation for this. So what we want to do is we want to sandwich this thing between two smooth bounds that we can bootstrap or use a normal approximation to consistently. And, and if this we is can stage one, this is a parameter for stage one, which which has non regularity due to the max over a two. That's right. That's exactly right. Yep, exactly. So, uh, yeah, because yeah, because of the max operator that's used in dynamic programming, this term here uh, is non-regular, meaning that it's sensitive to local perturbations, the generative model. And so, one approach would be to use a projection interval by first constructing a confidence interval for beta two, beta two star, and then working backwards that way. Or well, we're going to use a bound-based approach because it's less conservative in this setting. And so, what we we're going to do is construct. And ultimately, our goal is confidence intervals for components of beta one star or linear combinations of beta one star. So we're going to take this quantity and we're going to bound it between an upper bound that's smooth and a lower bound that's smooth. Then we're going to bootstrap those bounds, take the percentiles, and then solve for C transpose beta one and get a confidence interval for it. That's the idea. And so we're, the way that you get these bounds is by looking at local perturbations of the generative model and taking a soup over all those all those perturbations to get an upper bound and an inf to get a lower bound. And so this is the building block. So I'm going to show more here, but this is the building block for constructing that upper bound here. Basically, you take this, this term and you decompose it into a smooth part and a non-smooth part. This is the part we're going to have to work on bounding. And I've taken where the local parameter is going to show up and replace it with a gamma, because in the next slide, we're going to take a soup over gamma and that's going to smooth everything out. So uh, let me go to the next slide and just sort of see if that helps clarify things a bit. So we can show that root n, C transpose root n beta hat minus beta one star is VNC beta two st one star. So if you plug in a beta two one star into this expression, you get back this quantity. And so to construct an upper bound, what we're going to do is we're going to take UNC. This, oh, geez. Uh, I did not mean to promote UNC here. Uh, there are enemies. But um, anyway, so uh, UNC is C transpose. That's the smooth part we leave alone. Then for the non-smooth part, we're going to use a pretest as we did before. And this pretest is going to say if H21 transpose beta 21 star is far from zero, so you can think about it as testing this null here. If it's far from zero, then just leave it alone. Plug in beta 21 star here. But if it's close to zero, so this test statistic is small, then take a soup over all gamma of this term. So this will be an upper bound because the soup is over all of our p, and if we were to plug in beta two one star here, then you'd have the same term with an, with complementary indicators. So you would just reduce down to exactly this. Okay. And to get a lower bound, you can you can take an inf instead of a soup. 
So the point here is that, that this is indeed an upper bound and also that the soup smooths out the non-smooth functional. And it does that by, by taking all the local perturbations and taking a soup over them. And then we bootstrap the bounds to form a confidence interval. So uh, let me just formalize uh, what's happening here in terms of local alternatives. So if we let C again be fixed and we assume a local generative model with local parameter S, then under sufficient moment conditions, uh, we get the following limit for C transpose root n beta hat minus beta star. And the form of this, I mean, obviously it's, it's, this is hard to look at. So let me just point out the sort of really the, the salient parts here. So we have a smooth limit. We have another normal limit here. This is just an average over some features and a normal random variable. Everything here is, is fine. There's no S's here, so it's regular. Then we look at the second part. This comes from the non-smooth part. We have H21 transpose Z infinity. This is a normal a Gaussian random variable, random vector, plus the local parameter minus H21 transpose the local parameter. And we have these positive part functions. Okay? So again, we see this local parameter showing up. And it only shows up among those subjects that have zero second stage treatment effect. That's where that max operator was non-smooth or non-differentiable. And so this again confirms that this quantity here is non-regular. But if we take the upper bound that we constructed and take its limit, the first part is exactly the same. So if you compare the first line here the of two with the first line of one, you see that those are exactly the same. So, so the smooth part is left alone. But the uh, second term Instead of having these S's, we've now taken a soup over gammas, which is equivalent to taking a soup over S's. So we've taken a soup over all the, of, over the local parameters. And so uh, this is regular because it doesn't depend on the local parameters. So we souped over them. And it's also clearly an upper bound on this term. Okay. So to get a lower bound, again, you take an inf, you just have an inf here. Okay. So uh, this is our, our regular upper bound. We also have regular lower bound. And then to do inference, we, we are going to bootstrap that. So given a level alpha and some fixed vector C, let L hat and U hat denote the alpha over two, and one minus alpha over two percentiles of the bootstrap distribution of the bounds, meaning we bootstrap this quantity here. So we resample from the data and compute this thing uh, many times and take the percentiles and quantiles. Uh, and those are L hat and U hat. Uh, so L hat would be the lower percentile of the lower bound, U hat the upper percentile of the upper bound. And then let PM denote the distribution with respect to the bootstrap weights. Okay, so so uh, the randomness induced by resampling the data. Uh, then under sufficient regularity conditions, moment conditions, and conditions on the pretest. And for any epsilon, the probability, the conditional probability given the observed data under the bootstrap weights that C transpose beta hat minus the upper percentile of root n is less than or equal to C transpose beta one star as less than or equal to C transpose beta hat one minus the lower percentile of root n. This, the probability that C transpose beta star is in between these two bounds uh, is less than or equal to uh, one minus alpha minus epsilon uh, with probability, uh, or the probability that, that uh, it misses rather, uh, has error more than, more than alpha is going to zero. So just to unpack this is a little bit confusing. So this is the probability you cover under bootstrap. You want it to be at least one minus alpha. So you're saying the probability that it's coverage is less than one minus alpha minus some small epsilon that converges to zero. So it's saying the coverage uh, converges to one minus alpha of the bootstrap. There's a, there's a question, Eric, about um, so sort of so continuing to, to understand this concept of regularity or its absence. It, 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 can it actually be stated at some kind of uh, stability you mentioned how like small changes in the generative model can generate like abrupt changes in the limited distribution so that actually seems like some sort of loss of smoothness and i don't know if the, if it's formalizable in some you know, in some Lipschitz uh, or some stability type of way so the way it's formalized is if this limit contains s so if, so to go back to this assumption if you generate data what was that assumption here if you, have a, if you have this sequence of contiguous generative models, so you have something like this, uh, if under that generative model, the limit depends on the local parameter, then that's, that's the formal definition. So, which is what we see here, the fact that this S shows up under that model, that's how we know it's non-regular. But then there's this question of like, is that, does that mean, um, 
So it was the only way to figure out that it's not smooth to sort of go through and compute the limiting distribution. Uh, I think formally, but generally, if you have a non-smooth, well, okay, let me just be clear. There are settings where you have a non-smooth, say, operation with the data where everything's fine. Like uh, if you were doing like mean absolute, uh, you know, if you had absolute loss or something, right? If you have a convex function, but it's not differentiable, uh, that can still be okay, right? Um, so uh, there's various M estimators that, are, that have a non-smooth loss function where everything is fine. Uh, so the, the thing that intuitively, the thing that screws things up is when you have estimated things plugged into non-smooth functions. If you have an estimated quantity plugged into a non-smooth function, to do that, that's when you have a problem. And so here we have this sort of Bellman backup that has a plugged in estimated Q function in it. And then the max operators applied to it. That's sort of the red flag that you're going to end up with a problem. But the formalization is this. Is there an impossibility theorem that, that because because if it is due to an estimator earlier, you shared that in the max of means problem, this is unavoidable. People have shown like, you just can't get around by just playing with other estimators. It, it, is that still going to be true for like, let's say these two stage problems that no matter how we change now, no matter how we are clever about plugging things in, this non-regularity is not gonna leave us. That's right. So this is another example where there is an impossibility result. And the, the impossibility result comes, if you look at the at the estimand, right? If it's an, if it's, a non-smooth functional of the generative model in some appropriate sense, and the reference there is Van der Vaart, 1999. Uh, then, uh, and then there's Serrano and Porter, who I also cited earlier. They, then it's a, then then you cannot get a regular estimator. So, but the, the exception is it, it when it is when you use it. You you can you can have a smooth. I've, I said this once before, but I'll say it again. This is just the. If the estimate is not smooth, then you're in trouble. There's, there's impossibility results that you can't get something that's, that's asymptotically unbiased. You can't get a regular estimator. But there's also the case where you can have a regular estimate and estimate it with a problematic estimator and still get non-regularity that way. So in this case, because Q1 is non-smooth functional of the generative model, there is no estimator that's going to save you. Uh, but if you have an estimate that is a smooth functional, you could choose an estimator where you still have a problem. If that helps. So here there is no, there's nothing you can do in terms of choosing a better estimator. And, the and, and there was a comment that maybe can we replace max by absolute, but that, that doesn't help either, right? Because absolute values are also. Yeah, the, the that's, exactly, that, that's exactly what you would get if you had uh, coded the treatment as minus one, one instead of zero one. And in which case what you'd have here, instead of a positive part, you just have an absolute value. And the limit would be exactly the same. Okay. Yeah. So you still have this. You still have this issue. Yeah. Um, and the upper and lower bound uh, method for dealing with this problem is that's what you recommend, uh, as opposed to let's say the projection idea. That, like, in practice, this is a better thing to do. Yeah. So we ran the projection on this and, and this uh, in this problem, and the coverage was. Uniformly one in the interval itself was, I forget how many times bigger, but it was much, much bigger. Yeah. To the point where we didn't, I don't even think we included it in the paper because it was just so wide that it was, uh, yeah. So the projection uh, way of computing intervals is just uh, uh, like a, a textbook thing that you teach to, but I mean, but it's never useful. I think, it, I think in the max and means case, it's not so bad. Uh, and I also think it's a great way to start because then you then you can say, okay, well, now I have something that actually gives the right inference. Can I then make it adaptive somehow? And um, I think once you make it adaptive, it can be very close to the bounding approach. Uh, yeah. So I think it's a good. I think it's like the it's a good starting point. A good tool to get. Yeah. Like it's kind of like assuming everything is normal and nicely behaved and you're trying to develop a new method and then you work out what it is and then you say, what if it wasn't normal? What if, you know, yeah, I think it's like the first step. Um, okay, I wanted to just- Oh, also, stay. sorry. I also like maybe clarify what what's you and, and maybe people in this field mean when they say adaptivity, because adaptivity again, like it's just like dynamic it has. Oh yeah, sorry. So so what I mean is if you're in a setting where action, where, where the generative model is such that you could have used a bootstrap or you could have used a normal approximation and everything would be fine. 
because you're away from that point of non-smoothness, uh, then you want your method to automatically recover either the bootstrap or a series approximation or something that's going to be exact. And then, and then what you really want is a method that targets to the extent possible, only the parts of the problem that are not smooth. So like in the bound here, you know, you can see that we have this kind of smooth part that's left alone. And then we only have the soup affecting the second part, which is where all the, where the local parameter shows up in the original limit. So the idea is that we shouldn't be messing with this part or, or any, adding any conservative in this first part, any conservatism in this first part, because we don't need to. That's the, that, that's what I mean by adaptive. So there, is it possible in this example, line two, um, uh, previous slide, so could, could the pro, could the real data generating distribution be such that the entire second thing doesn't play any role? Yes. What, what right. is that situation? Uh, if you had a, all all patients had uh, treatment effects bounded away from zero at the second stage. All patients had I see I see in that case. I see. Yeah. That's right. Uh, so this is, this is, uh, I always wanted to present a result that, uh, it's not mine, uh, but I, I, Tin Chong Wu, who's at, uh, was it, was it Michigan? Uh, and this is a result that he derived and I, just, I thought it was really nice. Uh, this is, and so I wanted to present this. And it also is one of the things about these bounding approaches is that you can sometimes get conditional coverage and also uniform coverage, uh, for free. Well, I mean, if you're willing to do a bunch of proofs, but I mean, it sort of comes, sometimes comes automatically without adjustment. Uh, so uh, what he showed was that given a level alpha and vector C and L hat, and you had just the bootstrap percentiles as before the bounds, PM again is the bootstrap distribution. Then under moment conditions and conditions on the pretest, then for any epsilon greater than zero, we had the same theorem as before, the bootstrap, prob the bootstrap coverage, the probability that's less than one minus alpha minus epsilon is going to zero. Uh, but, uh, if you take the worst case coverage over P, uh, it still, uh, covers. So if you take, uh, that is you're, you're taking the inf over the coverage here as a function of the generative model, uh, it still covers over a very large class of distributions. And I'll refer you to the paper to see that class, but, um, so you do, there was some there was there was some mention of you know uniform results over distributions and this is one of those cases where that happens, uh, and so I just thought I would I would show that um, as a nice result from Chen Chuang. I don't know if he ever published this or not. I think it's in his dissertation. Um, so uh, so that's that's a nice bonus of these bound based methods. You can also often show that they give you conditional coverage, uh, meaning that if you conditioned on the rule, you also get correct coverage. Um, so I'm going to skip over the, these uh, simulation experiments uh, and just let you look over them uh, if anyone's interested in your own, uh, because I wanted to skip ahead to uh, a little bit of discussion and then I think we have a break. So uh, we have a break very soon. Actually, I mean, we're already in the break, but we started a little bit late, so maybe a couple more minutes. Okay, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to skip to like, what does this have to do with infinite horizon problems? Let me just say that uh, because I think there's. So we've looked at, at, at no stage problems, one stage problems, two stage problems. And now, uh, you know, a lot of the things that, you, that, that, I, that I think, you know, we see in the usual RL world are like, you know, MVPs, infinite horizon problems. So I just have two quick hand wavy slides about what does this have to do with an infinite horizon case? I wanna show how the bounds work in this case. So suppose you have data from a homogeneous MDP and I'm not gonna say all the regularity conditions you need for an MDP. Um, but uh, you have you know, state S1, action A1, and so on. And suppose you observe these trajectories up to some time point T. So it's an infinite horizon problem, but you've observed data up till time T. So it's a batch, you observe a batch of data, these N ID trajectories from I equals one to N. And A is uh, randomized? Uh, the treatment is, it has, there's some behavior policy that's used to generate the actions of the treatments, uh, but they don't have to be completely randomized. But, but they, they assume they, are, they have to have non-zero probability of assigning each action. Well, we'll assume that for now, yeah. And you have some utility UT, which is a function of state, action, and next state. Uh, so ST is a state and AT is the action. Here I've coded at minus one, one. And suppose you're looking at the discounted reward case and you posit a linear working model for the Q function, say QSA, 
beta is phi s transpose beta. And suppose you're going to estimate beta hat by solving this estimating equation. So this uh, you'll recognize uh, from greedy GQ. Uh, also see this paper by uh, Ashkan and uh, Etterfe and, and Ron Schroederman. Um, uh, so essentially, you have uh, average over the subjects, sum from t equals one to t, utility plus the maximized next stage. Cube. This is this is a t plus one. This is a typo. That's a t plus one. Beta minus phi s t transpose beta phi s t. So this here is a t plus one. So that's the maximized next stage q function. This is somebody asked about absolute value. Well, this shows up. So now now what do we do? How do we use a bound for something like this? Uh, so what you do is you um, if you do look at some algebra, you can show that this quantity, root n beta hat n minus beta star, is in fact a root of uh, v n h beta, so a root in in uh, in h of this quantity here. So something that is normal and smooth that depends on beta star, plus something that's going to converge to a constant matrix. So that's phi phi transpose times h plus a sum of Gamma, that's a discount factor. Phi of st plus one transpose root n beta star plus h minus gamma phi of st plus one transpose root n beta star phi s t. Okay, so this is a p-dimensional uh, equation. If you find its root, you get back this. So now, what do we do? Well, uh, if we want to bound, given any c, suppose I want a confidence interval for c transpose beta star. I want to construct a smooth upper bound on C transpose written beta hat minus beta star. I do that by taking the soup over some set of local perturbations script SN. C transpose times a set of all roots. So this is not standard notation, but root H means the root of VNHS in terms of H. So uh, then this has to be an upper bound because I can plug in uh, beta star for S. So as long as SN contains beta star, I get back this thing, so it has to be an upper bound on this. And it turns out that if you choose SN appropriately, you can bootstrap this thing. You construct its quantiles. You can get a lower bound by taking an inf. And so this is how you can use all these ideas, you know, in the infinite horizon case. Now, in terms of like, if the here I here I've kind of made it easier by looking at IAD draws. If you just had one long continuous draw, then what you'd end up having is you'd still have this sort of normality, but the way you would argue it would be through some kind of Martingale central limit theorem type thing instead of just a regular central limit theorem. So here I'm letting n diverge. If when I write Zn saying this is asymptotically normal, I mean it's n diverges. You could do the same thing as t diverges, but it's more complicated. But the point is, as because it's an implicit root, we can we can construct upper bounds this way, and that's how you that's how you can get inference for beta, uh, and also just to make it clear, the fact that you have this uh, absolute value term here and this uh, root n b eight beta star, that's what's going to signal the non-regularity here. Because if we replace this with, uh, let's say, beta star n, which is like uh, some local perturbation, that perturbation is going to remain because we're going to scale by root n, so it'll show up again. So, OK, so maybe I'll, I'll stop there for the break. Uh, Oh, so there's an, uh, can we generalize the infinite horizon bound approach to more complex actions? Uh, we can definitely generalize it to, so, so right now I, I would say I can definitely generalize it to any finite number, any finite action space. The question is, what about a continuous action space? And there the answer is maybe. I think it will depend on the form of the Q function that you use, uh, what it will look like. So, I mean, I think conceptually you could do it. I haven't sat down and tried to do it, so I don't quite know. Um, and having, a, having a continuous action space, do, might that actually alleviate some of the problems with non-regularity? Maybe, I don't maybe know. It might, sm it might smooth things out somehow. Sorry? Maybe then like max over a nice enough continuous set doesn't give you weird behavior or do you think it's so generic that it's just genetically the problem will be there even if you go to continuous action space? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there is maybe it does smooth things out somehow or or, or something. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. But I, I don't know offhand. It's, yeah. And 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 you were giving some not a definition, but you were giving some intuition about when non-regularity manifests. 
itself. Oh, by the way, I should announce that officially we, we are done. So people who want to take a break, should feel free to take a break. Um, we restart at uh, 2 Pacific and 5 Eastern. Um, Eric, so yeah, so you're giving this intuition that just having a, a non-smooth function, it doesn't, it doesn't signal non-regularity because you could be doing like M estimation with absolute loss. So if, if the non-differentiability applies to data and that's defining the estimator, that necessarily is not a problem. But when you plug in an estimator into a non-smooth function, that's usually where problems start to begin. Is that right. really right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And so in the previous slide, this right, just one previous to this one. Um, this is now sort of recursive in beta, right? So, so the non-regularity is still there because somehow the absolute on beta shows up in the equation for beta itself. Yeah, that's right. That's why the, that's why it's uh, that's why there's an issue. The part on bias, I still don't like. What's the message? Like, we should not worry about that, or because I, I didn't like non regularity. I think I'm getting kind of the feel for for what you're saying. But the discussion on asymptotic bias and the fact that it's very hard to get rid of it by 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 shrinkage. Like, is is there a message beyond that? I, I wasn't sure if I got the point. I, I think what I, I was trying to say is that we it may not. It's it's there and it's significant of it, but there. The, the cure may be worse than the disease in terms of trying to get rid of it. Uh, oh, okay. Is what I was trying to say, yeah. So it, it just... Live with it. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. Live. Construct a method that can still work, you know, even if you don't reduce that, uh, because you'll pay a price in variance or by making more bias than you started with. Yeah. yeah. Let me just quickly check this card and then I'll let you take a break. All right, yeah, no questions anywhere. So I think we'll just reconvene in 20 minutes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Oh, wait, no, there's one more. There is one more. Just came up. Uh, do I know of any companies that are working on statistical RL? Uh, yeah. So I think, um, I think uh, Amazon is definitely getting into this. I think uh, obviously Google has a huge presence in terms of um, uh, its RL and I'm, I'm Certain there are there are many others. Um, I actually was was doing some RL for um, Delta Airlines before. Well, no one flew anymore, and there's no like, <laughs> yeah, there's there's no more problems there. But uh, yeah, I think there I think there are. If you want to send me an email, um, I can try to send you to the right channels in terms of of, of finding a postdoc in that vein because there's some pretty cool problems and also you know they there there there's rl problems showing up in places you might not expect i think uh so you know i mentioned some of the ones in the beginning but just um people are starting to realize that like just because something doesn't have a ton of data volume that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be quantifying information gain and we're starting to see more more uh maybe this is my own bias but i personally have become much more interested in sort of the old experimental design literature, you know, starting in the forties where they had very limited experiments and they were just focused on maximizing information because that's what we're finding with these really expensive RL type problems where if you're going to make a decision and it costs you a lot, uh, then every, just every action really matters. So it's not the same type of problem as we would think, okay, well, if we're going to build a poker player or a chess bot or, or a go player, right? then we need to be super computationally efficient and also very clever in terms of all the algorithms and so on. But uh, we don't want it, we wouldn't be willing to spend a day on computation for each action in building a chess player, right? So it's a totally different problem in, in the sense of how information gain is weighted relative to data volume because the cost of data is so expensive. So I think that's a kind of a neat area that's emerging in industry, um, at least in my own little bubble. Um, so yeah, you you know. experience the this business of uh, creating confidence intervals and, and worrying about the, the bias and, and, and regularity. Obviously, this has direct implications in like a setting like clinical trials, social behavioral sciences, because scientists are involved and they want confidence intervals. Do you think this is still relevant in your in your consulting work with like companies? Do this do they care about this stuff? So it's surprisingly similar to uh, what I found is that, it, that, it, that the experience working with clinicians is what turned out to be super relevant because, you know, 
there will be some some basic question where the you know, the expert wants to know, like, uh, you know, should we paint our signs pink? You know, we 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 had two stores. I mean, this is not a real question. I don't think Amazon's ever painted their signs pink, but like, you know, they'll they'll supposedly they'll do that at two stores, and it looks great. And they'll say like, do we know? Should we do this everywhere? And also, like, if you build some kind of forecast model, they want they want interpretation of the coefficients. You know, it gets back to like Stat 101 only now, maybe in RL world, or like, how much better will my model get if I run these experiments you're suggesting? You know, and can we get confidence intervals around that? And so, uh, so there really is, there really are humans that you're interacting with who have a lot of like deep expertise in the application area, but then, you know, maybe don't have the experience in RL and they want to make use of that. So there's a communication issue and a kind of transference of expertise somehow or something. Uh, so, yeah, so I mean, that, that it ended up being strikingly similar. Uh, so I, I know people are doing, uh, this is my own little soapbox. I tell my students this all the time. Is everybody, not everybody, but there's sometimes some, some interest in doing the coolest, latest, fanciest things. And then you go out and you, see, and you realize that the right tool was like uh, some, some solid classical kind of techniques. Um, so we have to keep both of those in, 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 in mind somehow. Uh, anyway. I mean, the classical tool set is classical for a reason, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> I think there's, there's some sort of evolutionary process that sort of kills over time methods that didn't find a wide variety of use. So. Yeah, that's right. They, they have they they have survived. So they're they're we're, we're running our own like uh, I don't know evolutionary algorithm in our research space, and sort of spawning our little children, and then some of them survive, and then others are just lost to time. Yeah, but it's um, it's actually very interesting to hear that. Um, that, that yeah, like in the industry also that they want like these kind of guarantees because maybe too much it is at risk. Um, and I, and I, I mean, I have my own selection bias, which is like those are the kind of problems I'm likely to somehow be directed to. Right. I mean, I'm obviously people doing like uh, the advertising stuff and the search stuff, you know, and maybe like uh, recommender systems for music and movies and whatever. I'm sure they're doing. Um, really classic, not classic, but at least, you know, more conventional type RL or banded type stuff, I would think. Um, but even when I was at Google, uh, I, you know, ended up working on, you know, a lot of people work on advertising, but I ended up working on like data feed quality evaluation over time. And so like, um, that was again, one of these like RL sequential decision problems where actually the amount of the actions, the number of actions were very small uh, because you're looking at like, I don't know, maybe you have like 10 providers of data and you want to sort of evaluate their quality, space and time and then decide what, what you should, which ones you should go with. And so even, you know, so even in these companies that are known for like big data and, and big horizons and stuff, like they have those kind of problems.